I've been on the heels of the validation question for a while now. <sighs> Even before I made that video on the validation question itself. And whilst I'm skeptical that we can fundamentally arrive at a solid c conclusion, much less a solution, I think I'm getting closer to something, uh, whatever that might be. So this video is just going to be a thoughts out loud spoken by word of mouth kind of video. And I'm going to try to connect the dots of what I'm seeing here when, uh, when I think about this issue. And there's a reason why I cite David Hume in the beginning, because despite all of the instinctive, or perhaps because of it in part, uh, there's a lot to be said for empiricism, for the experiential, for that which is experienced. So before I get to the actual validation question and how it relates to MIGTO, men go in their own way, I want to talk a little bit about, well, experience and how that affects us. Most of us have learnt, and the word learnt is well, probably a poor description, but it's common parlance, so I'll use it, that you probably shouldn't touch a stove when it's hot, you know, turned up to, uh, on the dial to number three, or whatever it is your stove might go up to. Maybe you actually burnt yourself on a stove, maybe not, but that's kind of the starting point of the experiential, what can be empirically verified. Some of you might have been lucky, never burned yourself on a stove, you were simply told that, and then sort of wised up to the fact. But, and that seems pretty obvious. It's obvious that you probably shouldn't touch a hot stove with your bare hand. Uh, you learned somehow that you probably shouldn't cross the street when a... Uh, now, 40-foot bus is uh, heading down the street at 50 miles an hour either. I mean, it seems like common sense. But there might be something more to it. But there are other experiences which are potentially just as dangerous or painful or worthy of being avoided that you don't really hear about. And this might seem random or totally just off-topic, but... Some of you might be acquainted with food poisoning. Now, I've had the fun of having food poisoning about three times in my life. Each time it was worse. And for those of you who know how bad food poisoning can be, you experience eventually a, what I would consider a nigh-paralytic pain. I mean, you're in agony. But the last time I had food poisoning was about two years ago. I could barely speak. I mean, I was just grunting uh, because it was so painful. Eventually, I expectorated and that solved it. But the point is... I could describe to you what the pain is like. It's near paralytic. Uh, you can't really, the pain is so great you can't even concentrate on speech. So, uh, and I'm sure there are other experiences that are similar to that, that you, you know, you're just sort of grunting, wincing in pain, rolling around and so on and so forth. You could imagine that. You could create a picture, an image for yourself if you tried really hard, but without the experiential, without the experienced fact of having gone through it, you probably wouldn't know what I really was talking about now, would you? It's too obscure for that. You need to have actually gone through it, right? You need to have actually processed it. Things like walking in front of a speeding giant bus, or touching a hot stove, or putting your arm in a burning campfire, it, there's a direct connection there. Uh, maybe you were warned as a child, uh, maybe you simply observed people doing it and <laughs> receiving the penalty for their ignorance or stupidity or poor choices, who knows, but there's a direct connection there. But you know, there's a, there is a host of other things in life that are far more abstract, far more obscure, or just far more removed. I mean, there's nothing abstract or obscure, say, about food poisoning, but you might not know what I'm talking about if you've never had it. Uh, once you have it, you will, vaguely, because um, it's still not 
and this is something I'm going to be talking about in a bit as well, it's still not my food poisoning experience is not your food poisoning experience. And for those of you who have never had a food poisoning experience, my food poisoning experience is not your food poisoning experience at all. There's not even a semblance of similarity because it simply is not there. And that is where things get complicated. This is the point where things get complicated. Many things are learnt or appreciated, or better put, apprehended by custom. Don't walk in front of a speeding giant bus. Don't put your hand on a hot stove. Don't put your hand in a, a raging bonfire. Don't jump off a thousand foot tower. These things, because the consequences, whilst the actual physical details cannot be imagined or envisioned, are still there. In many cases, such as the, the bus or jumping off a thousand, it's, it's death. We have a desire to avoid death. It's, that is instinctive. Uh, so that that's kind of readily comes to us as as uh, as a function as a, as something to to just not do. What about the more abstract things? And now I'm no longer talking about food poisoning. What about things like emotional anguish, pain? Very different, but maybe not so much. Custom and habit teaches us to appreciate things and apprehend things in their proper uh, dimensions, in their proper positioning, and in, in their proper relation to the world and to you. That's why something immediate or immediately dangerous such as the bus scenario or the tower, jumping off a tower, you appreciate that, you apprehend it, you don't do it, usually. Some things are a little more abstract, or not abstract, but a little more, well, rare, right? So in the case of food poisoning, so I'm pretty cautious after having experienced three uh, food poisoning thrice uh, in my life about certain kinds of food, certain kinds of packaging. I'm a little more cautious than, say, uh, Joe Smith, who may have never had food poisoning. Now, once again, custom and habit. You might be asking, where am I going with all of this talking about custom and habit. David Hume, who to this day I think is one of the greatest philosophers and very insightful, though he was wrong on some accounts just because, well, he lived at a certain time when certain insights and knowledge were not available. Has repeatedly in the inquiry into under, uh, about human understanding uh, made the assertion that custom informs virtually everything. Uh, like I said, he's missing out on a lot of the instinctive and, and internal cognitive processes that we, uh, we have, but nonetheless there is more than a kernel of truth to that. And here comes the question of validation. Slowly it creeps up upon us. Validation is sought by men for reasons, ultimately, I believe, of the non-experienced, which is just as valid as the experienced. If custom and habit teach us that it is the experienced, the experiential, which informs us in large measure of the world, then the non-experiential, that which has not been experienced, can do so in like terms. What do I mean by this? Well. If you're in the habit or custom of doing something since childhood and into adulthood, you understand it, you can appreciate it, right? Could be anything. Maybe you learned the fine art of carpentry because your father happened to teach you from age five onwards. You're not even a carpenter, and yet you're a whiz with uh, with those sort with tools and and shaping wood and, and building things. Custom and habit. 
What do I mean by this? I mean simply that, and I'm going to speak the frank truth, that the desire for affection, uh, for physical contact even, and I'm not talking of the sexual sort, for the validation of personhood is great, particularly great in children. And I believe at birth at least, probably distributed in equal measure in both sexes. And this is of course uh, speculation on my part, but I'm going to try to justify it. What happens once the child leaves the womb, though, seems to be a different tale entirely. If women experience, or female children, experience greater validation, greater recognition, greater attention paid to their needs, their desires, their need for warmth, affection, physical contact, then they will be accustomed to it. They will have the habit and custom of it. Consequently, they will need less of it. In the case of male children, of course, they are r routinely <clears throat> in a position to receive less of this. Of course, this is general, uh, the general sense. I mean, it's not always the case. Receive less of this. So it's the non-experienced, the fact that male children grow up without physical attention, without you know, hugs, warmth, uh, physical intimacy, and I'm not talking about the sexual sort, the, the familial phys physical intimacy that is, and is documented as being very important to the well-being of, of children and to human beings in general, without proper praise, uh, without attention, without concern, and so on and so forth. This non-experienced, this non-experiential, becomes effectively the experiential and the experience itself. So the non-experienced uh, custom and habit can, over time, transform, mutate into the experienced custom and habit. That is, an absence of something becomes a presence of something. However, that presence then becomes uh, more void than anything else. Thus, we have the problem with validation, the beginnings of it at least, that that need for validation uh, becomes far, far greater because of a long time absence of the experience. Men are simply not used to it. They're not used to the kinds of validation that women generally receive, and thus they, uh, they, they long for it. It is a true longing on the part of men. And that becomes their custom and habit. All right. And it's very difficult to break. What I'm proposing here is essentially a social construct that nonetheless, as I've always intimated in, intimated in my videos, has its basis in biology. The fact that, generally speaking, the golden uterus, the female is held to uh, or is maintained to be of higher value than the male in a general sense, leads to a, a social condition, it can only be called that, that ends up with her having less need for validation overall than men. It's not to say that women women have an insatiable need for validation, but in terms of its magnitude, although men are loath to speak of it, no greater, far, far smaller, far uh, more minuscule than that of men. So the absence leads to uh, the presence, or if you want to call void anything, I don't, maybe presence isn't the right word. The non-experience becomes the experienced. More importantly, the non-experienced leads to the experienced. So, or the desire, rather, to experience what has not been experienced. And it might be, it might seem that I'm sort of speaking in tongues, but I'm doing my best not to. The need is always present. It's a biological need. But the social environment has prevented the individual male, male from receiving it, and it leads to the conundrum that most men find themselves in. Desperate for validation. Desperate for validation the world, from, from the world. Uh, words of praise, acknowledgement of accomplishment, uh, and 
in the sense of the male mother need, I mean, there's sexual, raw sexual desire, which I, uh, which is, I think, actually more, the, this desire to conquer the female sex, to acquire sex itself, is more a reflection of, uh, much more a reflection of the, of the verbal aspect of things, of that need for praise. You know, the man, the, the, the Don Juan, the man who, who sleeps with many women, uh, he is accorded some so, sort of respect. He's betting many women, and hence he's accorded terms of respect. He receives some kind of verbal accolade. But what do men truly seek in women? And Barbaros has talked about this at length, this male mother need. It is the non-sexual, the non-sexual physical intimacy that has been denied to him uh, for the vast majority, if not his entire life, far more than the sex. Uh, the sex is just a means to the accolades. It is the external praise, that aspect of validation that was lacking. But it's the physical intimacy that he never received from his family, that he never received from his siblings, that he never received from his friends. Because God forbid you, uh, you, you know, you hug your own child. God forbid that male friends embrace each other uh, in in a physical act of warmth. All of these things contribute to the male mother need, and thus it grows and grows and grows. It becomes insatiable. It was not experienced, and so it becomes an experience that is sought after. It must be sought after, because that need is biological, of course, and social conditions have prevented that individual male from receiving or having that need, uh, need met. That is the base of the problem in my observation. Which, of course, leads us to another problem. Given the gravity, the strength, the depth, the power of that need, by means of all the things I've just explained, it, it's very clear that it, it, it almost certainly cannot be overcome by conventional means. And here's where I'm going to start talking a bit about MGTO. I've been thinking a lot about MGTO recently, uh, and the fact that I'm a man who's going his own way. I don't even know if I like the term so much, but I just kind of do my own thing. Let's just call it that for the time being, I guess, although we can kind of use MGTO in a general sense. A lot of it has to do with experience, does it not? We're talking a lot about experience in this video, the experiential, the experience leads to realization. And in the title, as you can see, I use realization in two senses of the word. In the first sense, we have, at least in the English language and in many others, realization in the sense of recognition, the awareness that it is, and acknowledgement, the awareness that that which is is also true. And then, in the second sense, you have realization in the sense of actualization. A project has been realized, something has been realized, it has been actualized, it has been committed, it has been done. In your mind, in this sense. That is, in a philosophical sense, and in a very real linguistic semantic sense, if you are to say or make the claim that I realize that situation X is such, you're effectively saying three things. One, you recognize it to be such. Two, you acknowledge such to be true. And three, you've actualized the existence and truth of that, internalized into your own mind, and likely applied it to your own life. Which, of course, is the problem. Because it's very, very difficult to realize things you have not experienced. This is, we're, we're heading towards a solution, slowly. Maybe we'll never get there, but we're getting closer, and that's the point get as close as possible. Men, in the general sense, many of the younger men lack that experience. Right? In fact, your average 18 or 20 year old has very little life experience, yet has gone through life deprived of the things he needs in a very individualistic, intimate sense. So his need is going to be all the greater. His need for validation, that is. He lacks the experiences to draw upon to inform his mind that 
would possibly, in many cases, lead to realization. And this is why you see many men going their own way, and not all of us by any means, but many of us, as being, well, well, old farts, for lack of a better word. I'm not exactly young here, and there are those who are still older. And why? We've simply had enough time on this earth to experience certain things. And whilst all those experiences are uh, different or have been different, they have led us to certain conclusions. Even more at the point, everyone's lived experience is different. And perception is different. I mean, there there's a whole body of literature, even in terms of investigative crime, as well as re regards to well, mirror, Hume talked about miracles, um, eyewitness accounts and testimonies. Eh? <clears throat> the individual's perception is biased in of itself. That adds to it, of course. So you can two individuals can undergo the same experience. Uh, in terms of, say, a relationship, and come out with a very different outcome. It's that perception, right? And with this, unlike a life-or-death scenario, such as you know, the bus, or the tower, or even putting your hand in a fire, the internal biological need for intimacy, coupled by the social deprivation of validation in the man, acts as a counterweight to his ability to perceive things accurately as reality actually is. And he will be essentially guided and led onward by an illusion of what he wants, despite having it in front of his nose, despite seeing it for, for himself, despite having it in front of his eyes. That illusion will lead him onward. He will remain confused, baffled, and not understand. So, even with requisite experience, men are in a terrible position because of their upbringing, because of their bi original biological need, which has been invalidated. <laughs> their need for validation has been invalidated by their social environment, which hinders them in their ability to actually understand what's going on with them, the world, their relationships with women, their relationships with the world, with other men as well. And you end up with the situation we have, this desperate need for validation. There are two aspects to it. There is the verbal and the physical, as I like to call it. The verbal aspect being that aspect of uh, seeking the accolades, that the, the, the praise that others can offer you, the pat on the back, the good job, that and the physical. And I believe sex, despite the physical pleasure that it brings, belongs to that realm, to the realm of the verbal. The other aspect of it is the physical, and that's the physical intimacy. That is the male mother need. It's the thing that every guy is afraid to talk about, because he might be seen as gay, as a wimp, and yet so many men crave it. They crave it more than life itself in some cases. They crave it far more than sex, let's be honest. So, in not acquiring it in childhood, and not having access to it in adulthood, and so on and so forth, the uh, desire for it grows and grows and grows, as I said, acts as a counterweight to, uh, to realization in, in every sense of the word, and then I'll repeat that because it's very important, those three senses, one, recognition, acknowledgement, and then actualization and in this context, internalization. It's very difficult for men to grasp something that may be harmful to them when the desire is so great to have it to begin with. And thus, we're stuck in a bit of a dilemma. Well, you might be asking what that dilemma is. Is that, as they say, you know, education starts uh, with the young, uh, there's a reason why most men going their own way are older. It's because of the experience, because of the experiences they've had. You cannot commute, uh, communicate experiences to others 
experiences of the abstract, experiences of the heart, and experiences of the mind and soul, if you will. Remember, you cannot communicate these to others. It is, it is a physical impossibility of language itself. Description is not enough. The powers of descriptivity that language, human language offers us, uh, these are not enough. It's not the same as saying uh, the young man Tim, Tim of uh, aged 19, it's probably not a good idea if you climb on top of the Empire State Building and leap off of it. These are things that he learned as a child, that these are the, the immediate consequences, death. It's life or death. Remember in one of my older videos when I talked about reactivity, that though that kind of reactivity is the most immediate. It produces the most immediate response. The man sitting in his flat, he hears about the earthquake, he gets up, he leaves. It's simple. It doesn't require thought. It doesn't require a thinking, a process of thinking it through. So the weakness if you will, of, say, MIGTO, and it's, it's, you have to be critical of your own self sometimes, is that it relies on experiences that, that not everyone has, in part, at least, and I'm going to go further with this, this could turn into a long video, it relies in part on experiences that not everyone has had, and it relies on a, a major flaw in human language, main, mainly, uh, namely, its, its lack of uh, descriptive power in communicating uh, and communicating abstractions, because as the abstract, that is what it is. No matter what your anguish is as a divorced man who's been deprived of your children, of the wife you thought that uh, loved you, you you can be wailing in in physical pain as a consequence of that emotional pain. I mean, you can you can you can you can be crying for an entire day, and 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 you can you can lose. Uh, 20 pounds in the course of a week because of nutritional deprivation, because of all that, all that emotional pain you're experiencing as a result of the divorce. And yet, when you seek to communicate that to the external world, barring the occasional man who's had a very similar experience, and remember going way back to my video on kryptonite, and of course taking into account your respective resistance to the kryptonite, uh, it's an abstraction. You are communicating an abstraction to the, to the outside world using language which is highly flawed, not because it's your fault, not because it's, it's the fault of your experience, but because we are limited in the tools of our communication. So here's where the problem lies. Internal exper experiences based on the internal are impossible to communicate. And perception is always different. There, another example, I mean, it's entirely possible, I will concede, that a man finds the, a, the microbacterium in the haystack, as I like to call it. His experiences will be vastly different. And people tend to take the personal and project it onto reality. And I'm going to get back to that in a bit, and I'm going to differentiate that. Look, let, let's, this is certainly not what I do on this channel. Um, though personal experience inform me, they do not... Uh, they do not uh, create the reality for me. They inform me, but they do not create the reality that I exist in for me. But many men who have had good experiences, if they want to call them that, I mean, like I said, perception is very flawed often. Individual perception will say, well, um, that's not been my experience, and then project that onto the rest of the world. That that, that particular female, the microbacterium that he is enjoying a relationship or a marriage with, is then the, the gold standard, if you will, for all other women. Ignoring the fact, and we all off, we have to be uh, clear about this, that even if Stardust had had brilliant, quote-unquote, loving relationships with women, which he did not, that would do nothing to change, say, the fact that worldwide, and it is really worldwide, I've been looking for months now at statistics in other countries that 70 to 75 percent of divorces are initiated by women, that women's hypergamy, particularly when enabled by the state, is, uh, is a disastrous and in some cases monstrous thing. That would do nothing to vitiate the factuality or the, the, the magnitude of a problem. 
it's uh, it's like saying essentially what it's like saying well uh, you might win the uh, the jackpot, the euro jackpot, a while back. Some guy in Frankfurt won 45 million euros, and then and the same. And then a couple of weeks later, he says, "Well, that's been, not been my experience looking for a job, or that's not been my experience with finances. The economy is doing really well. There are no there are no financial problems. People aren't suffering economically because the vast majority of the world is following the pattern of we're in a depressed economy and probably will likely remain so." Uh, for the next decade, right? But the guy there is enjoying his 45 million euros. Can't really see that anymore, right? He's draw he's basing it on his own personal experience. Now, most people, of course, would be smart enough, at least in the realm of economics, not to recognize that the exception is the rule. But once again, men are very biased by their biological needs, and furthermore, as I've mentioned many times in this video just now, their socialized, conditioned needs. Uh, or further needs uh, needs further by socialization to be to believe and base things on a singular experience when that experience might be good. And I did go off a bit of a tangent there. I'm merely stating that to explain <clears throat> the importance of the fact that uh, that what your ex individual experience might be is often, if it's positive, may not be reflective of of the general trend. Remember, we talk about general tendencies here. But how, do, how is a MGTOW then born? What, how, what is the process? Well, in the case of older men, and I'm, old, I'm using the term old loosely, although I have particular views to be euphemistic about age. Those of you who know me uh, on a more personal level know what I'm talking about, so have a chuckle at that. Uh, 30 onwards, say age 30 onwards, that a lot of it is association. By citing statistics, by citing information, by looking at studies, these studies corroborate your own experiences. And your experiences then inform you and allow you a more accurate picture of the world, the world you live in, your relationship to other men, your relationship to women, and so on and so forth. But in the same token, it's not the corroboration of your experiences that makes them factually accurate. It's the data out there that exist that make the things factually accurate. The corroboration is important because it's the experiential step towards becoming a man going your own way. You see where I'm getting at here? Um, the corroboration is extremely important, but it's it's not the actual truth itself. The truth is found in the rigorous and often scientific study of phenomena. In this case, in the phenomena, the, the reproductive uh, phenomena between men and women. But how can you communicate that to a 20-year-old? Once again, all abstractions. The only thing a 20-year-old or an 18-year-old or a young man lacking experience has are the facts if they are presented to them. But remember, those facts are an abstraction. Most will not even be able to put, put them together in a context to come up with something, such as, well, how hypergamy works in a relationship, if they've never had a relationship, if they only had one relationship, if the relationship is just beginning. I mean, the, the simple fact is, is that we become MIGTO by dint of our experiences, our experiences with women which in turn leads us to seeking answers. We study, we study the science behind it, we study the information that's out there that's available, and then we, in our own minds, make corroborations between the studies, the things that we've read, and our own experiences, lived experiences, the experiential, our own habit and custom, and this leads us to where we are now. Younger men some, there are always exceptions, are entirely, it's entirely possible that you go MGTO without any of that, you know. The, um, you can argue that men go in their own way, the herbivore version in Japan, the grass eaters are such men, months, most of them never even had relationships. However, I would argue that many of them watch their fathers, for example, wither away, 
uh, in in essentially loveless relationships and uh, working them literally working themselves to death uh, in offices, dropping dead at a far too early age because of stress and what have you. And so that experience is very real, and they experience it. They experience it at the hands of their own uh, genetic progenitor, and. In that sense, I, I do think uh, they were directly informed, uh, as much as one could, one can be, by someone else's experience. But so this is the great problem, uh, and with MGTOW and with validation itself, is that the desire for validation is so strong, especially in young men that it, it's, it's almost absurd. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I don't tell people what to do. But if I were to say to you, young, young man or young men, you probably shouldn't be pursuing relationships because ultimately, in the general sense, they're more destructive than constructive, more destructive than constructive. Uh, you might intellectually grasp that. You might, in terms of realization, as I mentioned, you might, in those sense, in, in actually three senses of the word, have the uh, sense of recognition and the sense of acknowledgement, but without the actualized and internalized, it will be of little help to you. Because you still want to experience that validation. You still desire it. You still seek it out. You still seek the verbal validation and the physical validation in both forms. So, your performance in the world, uh, your interactions with your peers, that is the verbal validation, and you seek the physical validation, which is not the sex, but that emotional intimacy that was denied to you as a child in the female you may or may not be together with. Even if you understand what hypergamy is, even if you understand that, generally speaking, women don't like men. They tolerate men. That's not the same thing, in fact. It's a vastly different thing. Hence why it tends to be the old amongst us that realize these things in the fullest sense of the word, in every semantic linguistic sense that word can offer us. Because for the need for validation to completely sort of dwindle to nothingness, at least that form of validation, the positive of that quest for validation must be perforce of necessity vitiated by the negative. That is to say, we, the older men going our own way, we have, we have experienced, we've had these experiences corroborated by, uh, by the facts out there. And that is the breaking point for us. It is the point where we realize that the negatives outweigh the positives, quite simply. The negatives outweigh the positives. As Pat Patrick Henryist uh, once said, aka life after men, it is the path of least resistance, which is effectively another way of saying the positives, uh, the negatives outweigh the positives. It is very difficult to communicate this to a young person, a young man, who, going back to the beginning of the video, since since being uh, torn forth from the womb, A, has been born with this biological need that's been denied to him, and then B, socially conditioned based upon that biological need to, uh, to ignore those wants. And so when he's, he's, he's literally told, the young male child is literally told that it's not only that it, those needs and wants are not important, but they're to be ignored. But of course they're not ignored, because how does it manifest itself? It manifest, manifests itself in all the things we see around us. In white knightery, in manginism, in, in your average male's uh, genteelness with regards to women, and his, and his deference to their every wish. There are many varieties of it. Man, man Muhammad has said it, what men, women want, men want. or Something I liked that um, Karen, the girl writes what said in a fairly recent video is, women are the people that give permission to men or to the world to feel certain things. Without thorough experience and without those experiences themselves biased by your own personal interpretation. So like as, as I said, you cannot... Uh, 
it's 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 not it's not your experiences that confirm the truth. It is it's the it, it, the facts that are available that can be that can be seen, that can be gleaned, that can be studied, that can be read. The corroborating force is very powerful and important, but the corroborating force is useless unless you have the experience to, from which you can draw upon to create a corroborating force to begin with. Which is simply, these, these are not tools available to the young person, the young man. These are not tools at all, and yet he has this all-consuming need, the physical need and the verbal need for validation. This is the problem. This is why, call me a pessimist if you will, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop making videos or I've given up the cause, it's a very, very difficult path that we all have ahead of us. The, well, for the rest of humanity, this is, for the rest of human history, this is going to be a difficult path. Because we have so many things working against us. We have, as I said, biological need, which you could, you could argue is a, uh, a, sub, a substratum. And the social conditioning, you could argue, is a superstratum imposed on that substratum, and you end up with just uh, on the both in the, su in the case of the substratum and the superstratum, this mess that we're in with regards to validation. And men will relentlessly pursue it until, essentially, experience teaches otherwise. And even then, they're exp I mean, how many videos have you seen of men being physically abused by their wives? In some cases, their wives having tried to murder them, returning back to it. That is how strong it is. Because the perception, as I said, the, the counterweight to, to accurate perception is the desire of being so great that it clouds and muddles your ability to think clearly, and more importantly, it muddles and clouds your ability to perce perceive things accurately as you would have in the case of a man accepting his wife back into his life after she tried to have him killed or beat him over the head with a sharp utensil or whatever. The perception is there that this simply cannot be and so nothing will come of it. Or in other cases, those rare men who find quote-unquote good relationships drawing upon their singular experience and projecting it onto the world as if it were uh, some sort of Gnostic truth. Uh, that oh, if only you try hard and work hard and, and, and use, a, use a filter and do this and that, which I've often likened to giving men advice. I mean, advising men to pursue serious relationships, particularly to pursue marriage, is identical to saying, well, just because you walk across a minefield doesn't mean that you're going to get blown up. There are ways you can navigate it. Well, sure, but there's no absolutely safe way of passing through unscathed. There's no absolute guarantee. Hence with marriage, why no right man in his right mind should get married. Because even if your cupcake is the delightful person she may or may not be, the state has effectively turned her into a weapon. Whether she chooses to make use of that weapon to pull the trigger of the gun that she has been placed in her hands, and I've talked about this in the past, that's up to her ultimately. And remember, power corrupts. So if she realizes that she has that gun, maybe it's a forty-four Magnum, she might decide to blow your head off. And it doesn't matter how discerning you were or how, how much you filtered. The, what matters is the potential destructive power she has. And that was a bit of a tangent, but I apologize. So this is the dilemma we have, gentlemen. It is a very complex issue that I find myself closer to understanding in the torrent of chaos that tends to be uh, my thoughts, but also very, very difficult in implementation, in, in, in implementing against it male mother need is is the physical element of the need for validation the verbal need are is done is uh, the, the the deeds men are human as man well, myth has often said men are human doings not human beings that that's the verbal need and that includes sex in my opinion 
because it, it, the, the, the accolades, the praise that is heaped upon the man who has bedded many women is not dissimilar to the accolades of a, of a job well done in some respective field. And we need experience to inform ourselves of things that are not immediate life or death scenarios. The life or death scenario or the, the scenario of immediate pain is something very different to the scenario of what could or sh might happen to you. It's very different indeed to the scenario of your psychology. How does the psychology work? How do, how does the, 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 how do these inner workings function in that context? So the realization process is once again threefold. Recognition, recognizing that something is, acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging that it's true, and realization, actualizing or internalizing it. Without experience, that final step, which is the most important one, cannot be taken. More importantly, our own bias, our own interpretive bias, will often not allow us to do so. As I mentioned, men who stay in abusive relationships, who uh, perceive or per stay in relationships where they, you know, their wife tried to kill them, or many other possibilities as well, when the desire is so strong, it will it will cloud the mind. It will block you from seeing the truth. And these, this is problematic. It needs to be talked about. It's not enough just to talk about, say, the benefits or the positives. We need to focus also on not the negatives, but what the difficulties are exactly. Those difficulties are quite, to be quite honest, very pronounced. And in coming, hopefully, to the conclusion of this video, I'd like to say that it seems to be the case that, as I said, the the only the only way you can finally overcome that to use I'm very fond of uh, life life after women's uh, quote there that the path of least resistance the the negatives vitiating the the positives because they're the negatives are just a lot greater a lot larger far more pronounced than the positives. That seems to be the only way, and the only way you can do that is by gaining experience, i.e. why so many men go in their own way are older, or in general so many men realizing the magnitude of the problem are older. And even, as I said, you have these pseudo-exceptions like like um, grass eaters, but I'm, I'm, I've read accounts actually of this. I have no doubt that the majority of them have just simply witnessed a broken system that their fathers had participated in, which ultimately led to their father's ruination and said for themselves that they would not partake of it either or uh, would not go along with it and, and then end up just like their fathers did. <sighs> so very complex stuff, I guess, but I think we need to dissect things piece by piece to arrive at uh, certain conclusions. and. I apologize if this video is abstract or even too abstract, but it, it's necessary to talk about these abstractions and make these distinctions. But, and we also have to be unafraid of speaking the truth. And if, if it means that the, the experiential is the only means to realizing something in the entirety of every sense of that word, um, this is going to be problematic. Um, on a positive note, there are a few younger individuals who can realize the merits uh, based simply on intellectual abstraction of some of these arguments, even if they're not lived experiences uh, for them, they themse for them, them for the, those men themselves, young men themselves, and can uh, can draw upon that. Certainly, the 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 marriage argument is a simple one. I mean. A lot of men realize that there's just nothing in it for them, but they don't. They they're still willing to pursue romantic relationships, which is of course up to them. I don't dictate to men what they should do, uh, which have all the emotional elements of danger that you don't have. Perhaps the financial ones, and depending on whether you're uh, uh, cohabitating, there's the palimony issue, which pff, totally won't get into that here. But they have all the emotional elements of danger 
uh, the physical elements of danger in some cases that a marriage can carry with it and they won't realize that simply because they haven't had the experience it's all just a thought experiment to them and they desire they have the, the verbal and physical need for validation and they seek to, and they seek to gain experiences but it's only by those experiences that they'll ever if if ever uh, arrive at the same conclusions as some of us and for most of the male section portion of humanity they never will arrive at those conclusions these are the men who as i've mentioned in this video have their vision their internal and external vision clouded befuddled and muddied by a desire that is just so strong it will not allow them the strength of this desire is just so powerful it will not allow them to see past their own experiences positive or negative and lifelong deprivation of physical and verbal validation uh, essentially creates a crack addict a, a cracked addict of proportions far greater than any crack addict uh, out there in my assessment I mean when we speak often of pussy addiction but that's just that's kind of just a moniker or a kind of uh, a, a term that sort of encapsulates a lot more that encapsulates the need for verbal validation and acknowledgement as well as the physical need um, and the, the, the problem, of course, uh, <laughs> is that the, I suspect all of me that the physical need for validation, uh, I think Angry Harry put it once, uh, the, the need for touch, right? That's part of that, that's male mother need, is far greater than the verbal one, because that's the, the verbal one is more easily acquired. Men can bed women, they can achieve and in academia and their jobs and athletics and sports but the intimate need the physical need for intimacy uh, men are not allowed to be intimate amongst themselves and obviously I don't mean sexual intimacy uh, and because they might be accused of being gay or abnormal or deviant or whatever they're also uh, not allowed to be intimate with women because women will despise them for that as much as women complain about the the man who sort of just fucks and chucks them that is the model that they respect I mean and I'm using the term respect loosely here all right that's the model that they find most attractive the man who seeks true physical intimacy the the, the power of touch uh, that angry Harry mentioned once he is despised by the woman he's together with. He is seen as a weakling, and remember, women hate weak men. There's only one section of humanity that has, or is at least permitted to have, weakness. It's not that men uh, with weakness um, don't exist in the eyes of women. It's just that they're despised. Uh, it's acknowledged that men are weak sometimes, but it's disgusting that they are. And uh, hence the vicious circle, the devil circle, as they call it in German, the never-ending cycle that ends finally with death when you get so old you just can't pursue it anymore. But the, the male mother need, that physical need for validation never being fulfilled in the form of a relationship because it's routinely denied to men because their female partners despise them for having it to begin with and for exercising it in during the course of the relationship itself never mind all the the verbal aspects which are more achievable the verbal the need for validation but uh, that too because it all of that was never present in youth that those needs neither physical nor physical uh, verbal were met during youth it just it just persists and goes on and never ends anyway I'm gonna stop here I've been talking a lot I admit and I hope it wasn't too rambly but it's a very complex topic and it cannot be 
talked about or even thought about in simple terms. So as always, thank you for watching, and uh, it should be interesting to listen to your responses and insights on this. And uh, yeah, take care.